Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack and I've been looking forward to this one for a while. It all started a little while ago when I was contacted by Duncan from all the way down in Australia with an offer to review something that really intrigued me. We're all familiar with the idea of digital tape players such as the Tapuino, TZX Juino etc and I've reviewed a couple of these devices on the channel previously such as the ZX Huey Tape and the ZX Frankenstein and these seem to be based on the Arduino platform and seem to largely derive from the original Tapuino project started way back in 2014 by sweet little Mr. E. There's a link to the GitHub page in the description and that itself was inspired by earlier attempts at cassette emulation. Anyway, there are a lot of these Arduino based devices on the market and they all work pretty well and in a similar fashion. However, this device offers something that seems quite unique or at least very rare in two distinct ways. One, it's not based on the Tapuino project or the Arduino platform at all and two, this device lets you record as well. So that promises a real retro experience for 8-bit bedroom coders. Join me as we discover the SVI CAS. So firstly let's address the name, SVI CAS. Well the CAS part is pretty obvious, it's a cassette emulation system and the SVI part tells us that this device was originally designed for use with the Spectra Video SVI 318 and 328. The current version works with a lot more machines and out of the box you now get support for the following. The SVI 318 and 328 as previously mentioned, the TRS-80 colour computer, the Dragon 32 and 64, MSX machines, the Sinclair ZX80 and ZX81, the ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC machines, Acorn machines, Commodore machines and the Oric 1 and Oric Atmos. You will need the correct cable harness for each system of course and a number of these can be supplied with the unit at a slight additional cost per harness. I need to give props to Duncan for the build quality of this product. For a small run manufacturer this feels like a superbly put together device and really well thought out in terms of the placement of the various elements. There's also a truly excellent manual that is both professionally worded and extremely thorough covering using the SVI CAS with each of the supported platforms and covering in detail both the standard operations and any peculiarities or additional info that may be relevant to one machine or another. I received a Commodore harness along with this review unit and I'll be using some of my standard cassette leads from some of the other systems to gauge compatibility. On the back of the unit is the power socket which is a standard 2.5mm barrel accepting 9 volt DC and this can be either centre positive or negative. Next we have the tape motor control for those systems that support it. Then we have the 3.5mm tape in or mic port and the tape out or ear port. At the front we've got this full sized SD card slot, the SVI CAS is expecting a FAT32 formatted SD card with cassette images properly organised of course to allow easy navigation. And at the bottom we've got this removable cover which I can't really find a reason for and suspect this is a hangover from this being a generic touchscreen case with a battery compartment and therefore this is just clever part usage but I'm fine with that as it all looks great. And that's it, no buttons or external controls at all with the reason for that being that this unit is entirely touchscreen and because of that you get this nice little stylus so you can keep the screen free from sticky fingerprints, a nice touch, no pun intended. For our testing today we'll see how this copes with my ZX8081 clone, we'll also test on my Harlequin ZX Spectrum clone, this Toshiba HX10 and the Commodore 64. Powering on the unit you get this nice little display and after checking that the SD card is being read ok you get to the main menu. This menu is divided into three main areas. This red bar at the top shows the currently selected pre-configured systems and tapping that will cycle through all of the out of the box configurations available. This middle green section is where you can adjust each of the configuration variables and these are board rate control, either automatic or manual, recording edge trigger, either rising edge or falling edge and we'll cover this a little later, playback control, computer control using the motor control function or manual mode. If both of these are off the virtual tape will play through from the start to finish uninterrupted. 
Timing Control. This is used for Commodore machines and is either PAL or NTSC or off completely. Audio options for both menu sounds and playback of the cassette audio noise, you know, if you like that sort of thing. Waveform phase can be normal or inverted. Again, we'll cover this a little later. So if we select ZX81, we can see that we have automatic board rate with rising edge trigger, no playback control at all, a PAL setup, only menu sounds and no cassette audio, and a normal waveform phasing. And at the bottom of the screen, we have a blue section with files and record. And then you'll see I've created some subdirectories on the SD card for each of the systems I want to test this with. And you might think you would select the directory with the stylus, but no. Instead, you have to navigate using these little arrows in the green area. So let's go down to ZX81 and then hit the open folder icon. In here, you can see we have a couple of ZX81 games, and I thought it might be nice to A, test that this device works, but also to test if my home-built ZX81 clone can load and play 3D Monster Maze, which of course we know it does. Pressing the play button on the touchscreen starts the virtual tape playing, and we can then see the ZX81 screen go completely blank, and that's because in this machine, the video circuitry is used to load and save from tape, so we won't see much here until the tape has finished loading. I'll speed these tape loading sections up for the sake of the video, but presumably this is the part of the process that cassette files would sit lovingly staring at the screen and have a nice cup of tea and a slice of cake while the anticipation builds. And that little beep tells us that the tape has finished, and sure enough, we're ready to go into a maze with a dinosaur for some reason. Well, that worked as expected, so we'll switch to the Spectrum now and see how that gets on. And at an attempt at being topical, we'll load up a classic Spectrum title. And we do this as before by first switching to the Spectrum in the top red bar, then navigating to the Spectrum directory with the arrow keys, and then preparing our cassette. In this case, Daily Thompson's Decathlon. See, I told you it was topical. I'm not actually going to load and play this game because it has to be one of the dullest games ever made. Practically every event is just pressing two alternate buttons. Anywho, it loads just fine. Now, although this is all very nice and working well, it's at this point not much different to having a Tapuino type device because they all do this, they all load games, albeit some of them are locked to one system or another, whereas this does work on pretty much everything. But what about recording to virtual tape? That's the feature that will appeal to those folk who want the full experience. So let's test that by typing in our favorite program, but this time with a little splash of color because I don't mind spending a bit of extra time typing it because I can save it, see? Well, hopefully. Oh, isn't that pretty? So let's commit this piece of coding history to media. And to do that, we have to first create a virtual cassette to record to. To do that, you pop into the record section and you're presented with an on-screen keyboard ready to name your cassette. Oh, hang on though. First, you have to make sure your working directory is correct. So we'll hit the home button and navigate to the spectrum directory. Once we're in there, we'll hit home again and then back to the record screen. You following this? It's a little clunky, but you soon get used to it. But this bit would really benefit from a proper touchscreen keyboard. To enter our cassette name, we have to navigate back and forth through the letters using the arrows and then hit the plus key to select a letter. I imagine you'll have a lot of tapes called 1111 and the like because this is painful. Hopefully later versions will improve on this. Now this is only a tiny program, so I'm going to let this run at normal speed so you can get a feel for how long it takes to record something of this size. Well, not very long it seems. So let's now navigate back to the files menu and see if we can load this back in. We'll clear the Spectrum's memory with the new command and then I'm going to have to swap the cable from the mic back to the ear socket. Two ticks. Right, let's try and load that cassette we created back into memory. So we'll issue the load command on the Speccy and then navigate to the file section, down to Spectrum, and then select our 1111 cassette. Those names really will get irritating. Please sort the keyboard out, Duncan. We'll press play on the SVI CAS, and the Speccy should do its thang and load back in from that tape our wonderful program. And here it is, in its Technicolor glory. Wonderful. 
Now, while we demonstrate this device working on the MSX and the C64, let me quickly talk about those configuration options we mentioned earlier. Firstly, the waveform phase. Almost all machines have a waveform phase of zero, which means essentially a normal signal, but for some machines, such as the Acorn Electron and the BBC Micro, the waveform needs to be inverted to 180 degrees of normal in order for the machine to be able to read it. I'm sure someone out there can explain why this is, because I can't. And then there's the recording edge trigger. This determines whether the signal from the cassette is high on the rise of the signal or on the fall of the signal, similar to how triggers are set on oscilloscopes. 99% of the time you won't need any of this though unless you're trying to get this to work with something quite obscure. So what do I think of this device? Well, actually I think it's really cool. Yes, it does take some time to navigate through the menus and the interface is a little clunky, especially with text entry and editing of cassette names. However, if you're the sort of person who's really time conscious, I doubt you'll have the desire to be waiting for virtual tapes and you'll be happier with an SD card solution instead and I put myself in that category. But there are a lot of people out there who really enjoy the feeling of cassette saving and loading, using the actual cables and original methods they used back in the day. And for those people, this is a great device and a really clever way of removing the problem of old cassettes becoming rare or unusable, but honoring and maintaining those retro cassette processes. If you're interested in getting hold of one of these, they cost around 85 Australian dollars, which is around 45 pounds or 62 dollars US. And although there's not currently a website to purchase from, you can contact Duncan via the email address in the description for details on how to order. As always, thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell for notifications of new content. If you'd like to support the channel, there are a few ways you can do this. You can become a Patreon of the channel, or you can simply buy us a coffee. Links to both are on the header on the main page, and both help us to continue to get cool new stuff to test and share with you all. Or if you have something to donate to the channel, please get in touch via email. Please do leave your comments below as we always love to read them. And until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.